Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Hello? Cool. Um, I guess it's about uh, 1030, so let's go ahead and start. Um, my name is Kevin Finzi. I uh, do many things in Fedora, but uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Rawhide and all the stuff that I do uh, in Rawhide, and uh, a lot of things about problems we've run into and uh, interesting things uh, that we fixed and uh, why you should care and all, all sorts of things about Rawhide. Um, if anyone has questions at any point, just feel free to, to raise your hand or, or shout out your question. Um, uh, there will also, of course, hopefully be time at the end for questions. So I'm going to kind of look over uh, the past uh, that we've had with Rawhide. Um, move this a little bit um, and then kind of where we're at now and then uh, some thoughts and problems that we're ha we're hitting now and uh, hopefully we can brainstorm some solutions uh, to to some of the things we're seeing so I don't know if you guys can read this uh, it's kind of small print but rawhide is almost 20 years old uh, this email was sent to the uh, Red Hat Linux Devel list on uh, August 18th, 1998, uh, announcing the first Rawhide uh, uh, release. Uh, you can see at the bottom there they dubbed it Rawhide, and of course over the years that's changed to Rawhide, just one word. Um, so uh, there's a long history here, and we've had it around for a very long time. Um, so looking back at the past. Uh, Composes mostly daily. Uh, it was at first internally and synced out, so there wasn't a whole lot of visibility into what was there until it was synced out. And this was just repository trees only, so it was groups of packages, uh, no images or uh, artifacts uh, in particular. It was just a tree of a bunch uh, to begin with. Um, kind of a preview of the next release, but not necessarily an exact copy of what the next release would be, just more like a, uh, a test uh, compose type of thing. So then we, of course, uh, had uh, Core and Extras uh, merge into Fedora. And uh, this was the era of uh, MASH. We used a tool called MASH uh, to compose Rawhide. Uh, this was done, of course, in the open because Core and Extras merged out. Uh, MASH uh, had multiple architecture support, so it could uh, compose various different architectures. But uh, each MASH, each instance was separate, so there would be a, a Spark Rawhide and a PowerPC Rawhide Compose, and uh, all the architectures were kind of done independently on their, their own time. Um, this actually, toward the end of, of MASH's tenure, started producing more than just a tree of packages. We also produced a boot ISO that you could actually use a net install ISO to, to install from that tree. Um, and toward the end of this tenure, also FedMessage started appearing. And we added FedMessage support to MASH so you could see when composes finished and when they started and, and when it went through various phases uh, as it went along. Um, let's see what else was I going to mention about MASH. Um, yeah, so uh, MASH served us long and well, uh, but it certainly had its its share of issues. And uh, then along came uh, so some more uh, issues that we ran into in the in the MASH era. Um, it was failures at this point were. A, a particular kind, usually what meant that the build root that it was trying to build this compose in failed for some reason. So it was a very fundamental package that broke. It was pretty rare that it happened. It would have to be, you know, the installer or um, the kernel or something very, very low level for, for this to break. So it didn't break that often. Uh, MASH also was built on a code base of yum and Python 2 and all those great things. And of course, when we started getting new features in RPM, uh, rich dependencies and things like that, it had no concept of them. Um, 
one of the interesting things we ran into uh, somebody added rich dependencies to a package in Rawhide back when we were using MASH and when yum sees a rich dependency it it looks at it like somebody said requires something or something else and it says requires I can't find package or <laughs> so it just bombs out at that point and doesn't uh, process anything after that so obviously we needed uh, a better solution uh, for all the new stuff so of course along comes Pungy. Uh Pungy is uh, another tool uh, that does use DNF, it uh, is Python 3 aware, et cetera, et cetera. And really one of the fundamental changes here is instead of just building a tree of packages, uh, we wanted to build everything. We wanted to make every compose like we were gonna release the whole operating system. And there was a, a specific reason for this with the old days with MASH and Rawhide, you would go along, MASH would be fine, you could compose a rawhide tree, everything would be great there. But then when it came time to actually do a release, you found all these problems. You couldn't build images, uh, you had uh, dependency problems or, or whatever. And so we specifically wanted to make things as like a real compose for a release as we possibly could. Pungy actually produces all of the images uh, and everything that it produces is like it was a full release. So all the ISO images are there, all the checksums are there, uh, all the trees, all, all of everything that would be in a regular release is, is there in each nightly compose. Um, of course, this presented a much higher surface area, right? So before, the only thing that could break the, the composes were things that were in the build root or very fundamental things. And now, since we're building all of this stuff, anything that breaks any of those things that we require is going to cause the compose to fail. So obviously we have a different uh, issue here. Uh, one of the things we also added uh, is Dusty here. I don't see him now. Uh, Dusty actually came up with this idea and it's been very helpful for us. He set up a Pagare instance and it listens on fed messages and when a compose fails it writes a ticket and shows all of the tasks that failed. So one thing that's this been really helpful for is coordinating. But, oh, sorry. Um, one of the things that this has been really helpful for is uh, coordinating between people trying to fix problems. Because often there's multiple problems or people one person starts working on it, doesn't tell other people and they start working on it, etc. Um, so if you're curious as to you know what's failing the compose or or what's going on or who's working on it or whatnot you can look in that you can look in this issue tracker and see um, you know what the most recent compose failure was and and what uh, the release engineering folks think is is going on on that um, it's a bit overwhelming because obviously we do a compose every every day so if there's failures there's lots of tickets in there but it's been very useful so I don't know how readable this is it's probably pretty small um, but this is from the rawhide page on the wiki um, and this is kind of the the high-level goals of rawhide uh, to allow package maintainers to integrate the newest usable versions of their packages um, a lot of people miss that they're supposed to be integrating usable packages. We want this thing to be usable. We don't want to just throw something over the fence and, you know, oh, that's broken completely. No, you want to make sure that, that what you're doing there is integrating something that's useful and usable. Um, ah, connection failure, excellent. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it also allows advanced users access to newest usable packages. Uh, it allows incremental changes to packages that are too small or too large for other releases. There's a lot of things that we could do in Rawhide, uh, you know, simple fixes that don't actually uh, need to be pushed out to every user. Uh, a good example of this is uh, recently, I think it was RHEL 6 timeframe, the RPM specs used to have a build root uh, invocation in them. You could specify what you wanted the temporary build root to be. And ever since RHEL 6 days, that has 
had no effect in uh, in our RPMs. It RPM just defaults that to something sane. So somebody actually went through and cleaned up all of the spec files that had those still in it. So it doesn't actually change anything. It just gets rid of cruft or things that confuse other people when they're looking at the spec file or uh, whatnot. So, you know, if there's a, a very minor issue, you can push uh, into Rawhide and make sure that it's working before it goes into stable. Um, and so it's a good arena for those sorts of changes. Uh, also, the we recently added uh, this last line about GCC and glibc. It's a, a place where the low-level packages uh, can gain real-world real world testing in pre-release versions. Fedora works very closely with glibc folks. Um, they try and align their cycles so that you know they can uh, take advantage of the Fedora Mastery build to see what's going on in the compiler or glibc. Um, and it's very beneficial to both of us because by the time a Fedora 29 comes out, it will have the latest glibc and GCC, and they will have had all this test data of this huge distribution building all these strange things, and you know, working the bugs out of uh, out of their tools. So, uh, just a little quick note about why we should care about Rawhide. Um, you know, the, the goals mentioned in the last slide um, are pretty important, but there's the integration work that we do in Rawhide is is just super vital for the rest of Fedora. It's If you don't have this ability to integrate stuff at that point, it becomes so much harder to to get that to users. And um, it, it, it really is something that I think everyone should care about. So here's a uh, interesting statistic. Those amongst you might notice how many times the Rawhide Compose has worked recently. Uh, I'm happy to report, I didn't add this to the slide, but we have a Compose today. We actually have a Compose today. <laughs> and I have a slide on why this has been the case uh, a little later here. But it, if you look at that, 11 completed, um, actually, let me, uh, let me back up a second. Uh, Punji has various states to indicate how the compose worked or did not work. Uh, doomed means that something that is a required deliverable did not compose, did not function, so it's no good. Incomplete means that all of the required deliverables did complete, but some of the non-required deliverables did not. So, uh, for example, uh, the i686 media is not a required deliverable. So there was a long time there, I, I forget how long it was, a week or two, when there was no i686 kernel. And so all the i686 media failed, which was fine for Rawhide, it just said incomplete because those things did not finish. Um, there is one other state that Punji has called finished, which is everything worked, everything composed. And earlier this year in uh, March, we actually had that happen. It, it like printed out Rawhide finished, Compose finished, and we're like, whoa, is that finished, finished? Everything worked? And then we found out it was a punji bug. <laughs> because uh, it had actually reported that everything worked, but uh, there's a number of tasks where it tries to make media for, say, four architectures, and some of them are not required, and some of those had failed, but it had marked the overall task as completed correctly. So. We'll get there. We will get there someday. Uh, those those of you who went to the uh, making composes better talk may be familiar with this uh, diagram, which I shamelessly stole from the uh, Punji website. <laughs> um, but this is kind of a, an overview of what Punji does and the steps. Um, if you're interested in this, obviously go go look at Punji or go look at the recording of the the making composes faster talk because they went into a lot more detail on this. But you can see that Punji does a whole lot of stuff. It uh, gathers a lot of packages, and Fedora is huge. I mean, there's 20,000 packages. Some of them are gigantic. Um, some of them have tons and tons of sub packages. So it's moving around tons and tons of stuff. And because we're trying to make this compose exactly like a real compose. It does, you know, 
tons tons and tons of stuff tons of images uh, we basically add images all the time or we add new deliverables all the time people come along and say oh well uh, like this cycle we have the um, uh, mini shift spin I think is going to be added um, we have all the labs all the spins uh, all the live media um, so tons and tons of deliverables so here's a kind of a, a quick list of things that break the compose now uh, or problems that I've seen that break uh, scriptlet errors when in an initial install chroot. so all of these image builds that are building live CDs or DVDs or things like that um, are done in Koji and Koji goes to a builder creates a mock chroot, installs packages in that and in some cases installs packages into a further loopbacked image in you know underneath that so there's all these layers of stuff here and at the lowest level you're installing you're using rpm and you're installing packages into a ch root that has nothing else in it right you're doing the initial install of these packages and sometimes maintainers don't think about this case so they'll do you know they'll call something that they don't have a a requires pre for or something like that in their scriptlets so it's not there it doesn't exist yet or they try and grep a file that doesn't exist yet because the package that has that file hasn't been installed yet or they try and look at something in proc or sys or something like that which it doesn't exist or they try, try and call uh, systemd and systemd is running in a chroot and it says no sorry I don't know what you're talking about I'm not in it <laughs> so that is a real common uh, issue that we see in the base packages um, unannounced uh, version updates for libraries causing broken depths this happens far too frequently still uh, somebody will update a package and not even realize sometimes that the library has increased in version and you know these four other things are broken and then we'll see that in the compose because it tries to install stuff and then it can't because the broken dependencies um, so that is all too common these days um, not fully coordinated moves changes in several packages we see this we see this uh, all the time I have a good example of this uh, in today's compose or yesterday's compose uh, which we'll see later uh, size changes this is another one that we see all the time actually lately it's it seems like it's been glibc uh, has had a lot of trouble with their locales so uh, a lot of these media are defined to a certain size and uh, somebody says you know this is a dvd or we want this under two gig or something like that and then glibc has some kind of bug or issue where they do a build and the locales are suddenly you know 500 gigabytes and then it doesn't fit and boom things things don't work so that that is an issue that uh, a lot of people hit uh, I think that could possibly be mitigated by kind of informing people more quickly what the differences in their their builds are you know you're doing a build of this package hey your last package was 498 you know gigabytes less something is wrong here <laughs> um, so uh, uh, yes exclude arch uh, is another one we haven't hit this too much recently but occasionally people will run into a problem uh, with a particular architecture and the process for doing that is to you know add exclude arch block the architecture bug and you know mention all the things to the architecture team uh, but the case this doesn't work on is things that we need in base images or build roots or things like that uh, I forget there was an example of this earlier this year uh, it was I don't know I, I can't remember the name of the package but it was some package that was basically in the basic pack package set and they excluded arm v7 and one of the arm v7 deliverables is required so no compose <laughs> so we have to be careful about that also it might have been yeah so here's a, a quick list of a few things um, <laughs> this is interesting uh, I only added locking to the compose process early this year before it would just compose it, it composes from a cron and it would just compose 
you know, however many, and we ran into this very, very bad problem with eight, um, which we recovered from, but I, I doubt very many people are aware of it. So Fedora 28, the run up to that release, we were doing RC composes and we got a uh, an RC that was gold that passed all of the tests. We were gonna release it, gonna release it next week. And unbeknownst to us or unnoticed by us, there was another compose running uh, previous to that, a, a bran it was branched instead of rawhide, but it, same principle. And it only finished after we had staged the GA release. Isn't that right, Mohan? It was like two days after, two days after the release, it finally completed. And of course, this messed up the staging of the the regular uh, Fedora 28 release. So we had to like clean up that manually and you know make sure everything was in the right place. So I put locking in place, and we have hit definitely hit cases now where uh, a compose has been running and the cron doesn't kick off because it has locking around it now, just to avoid these sort of problems where you get multiple composes stacked up behind each other. Um, we also had cases where a rawhide compose would go along, uh, another one would go along and complete, and then the first one would complete and write over the second, the one, the newer one that had already completed. Um, so the locking has definitely been a useful, uh, useful addition. Uh, why do we make the compose fail on required deliverables? Required deliverables. Um, we want rawhide to be alpha quality at all times. Um, this was part of the no no more alphas proposal that uh, we did with Fedora 27. So the idea is Rawhide is always alpha. It always meets the alpha criteria. The, uh, the deliverables are there, the test pass, etc. cetera. And uh, we have OpenQA running to do a lot of those tests. And Adam uh, Williamson, who is not here, uh, catches all kinds of things with with OpenQA. I mean, he's he's been filing stuff right and left as he hits it, and it's it's great. This also prevents us from having the problem that we had earlier with Mash, where you get to a, like a beta and you say, okay, well it's been composing, we're, we're probably great, and then you find out everything's broken. So if you keep things at a high enough quality to begin with, a background quality, then doing those beta and final releases are a lot easier. Um, composing all arches at the same time. As I mentioned with MASH, things were split out by architecture, so each architecture team did their own thing. And that ran into strange artifacts where, uh, you know, PowerPC would be behind, uh, say, um, ARM v7, or, you know, you run into these very strange uh, version skew issues. And um, this allows us to do all of the all of the architectures. We can uh, promote certain things from certain architectures as being release blocking or not. So like the uh, ARMv7 uh, XFCE image, I believe, is, is or the ARMv7 server image. Anyway, th we can des decide what architecture and what images are release blocking or not, and we don't have to worry about whether they're being done in certain other places or not. So that also is helpful, but it, of course, increases all the compose time. So this is a, a few of the more amusing little problems we've run into I thought I'd share. Uh, so we ran into a string of uh, compose issues where uh, Rawhide would not compose, and it was appliance images, which are ARM images that you DD to ARM devices, uh, that would not uh, complete. And if you was, all it would say is, uh, that is one of the ones that's sort of oniony. It it goes to the builder, it creates a moxie root, and it creates a loopback device, and it installs into that file that loopback file, closes that off, does some things, and then uploads it the result. Well, it was unable to unmount that loopback. Something was holding that image open, so it couldn't actually finish unmounting it. And this one was a big pain to uh, to track down. But the problem is, or looking at the changes from the previous working Rawhide, uh, SSSD had updated uh, their, their package. And uh, they had put in their package that certain files were owned by the SSSD user, right? Which is fine and all. But when they're installing in the chroot, uh, that has to be looked up. It, 
glibc says, okay, SSSD user, what is that? I'll look in the string of things that I have to look up. So it opened those libraries, and all of those libraries were already open in the ch root, except one library, the NSS systemd library, systemd's NSS user support, was not open in the ch root. So it would open the one in the image, because it was looking for this library, and there it was in the image. It would open that, look up the SSSD user, and then keep it open. <laughs> So this was worked around in uh, appliance tools. We uh, just basically added something to say, hey, when you start making an appliance before you start that loopback, make sure all of the libraries that you need to open are open in the ch root and not the image that you're trying to make. <laughs> this, this was a big, big pain to find. So let's see. Um, oh, another issue that we've run into. Uh, the way uh, package signing works, Rawhide is now fully signed. Uh, the way it works is you do a build and it lands in the F29 pending tag. And then uh, we have an automated process called RoboSignatory that looks at the stuff that lands in that tag, signs it, and then moves it over to the uh, F29 tag. And that's that's great, but every once in a while there's there's a problem with it. And usually it's because something we did like uh, re re rebooted servers, or there was a database outage, or you know some some issue that caused it to not process some amount of builds. There, uh, the problem then becomes that you get these packages that are sitting in there, and then later somebody says, "Hey, my package never got signed. It never went out." Well, if you then flush that queue out, you say, "Sign all these packages, put them in the right tag," but some of them are from five days ago. And so maybe there's a newer version of one of those things, and you've just tagged an older one on top of it. So you get these strange artifacts where packages go back in version, which is not what you want. So we need to, uh, we need to solve that uh, better, put some monitoring on it or uh, something similar. Ah, yes, I, I thought I would mention this. Laura is uh, shaking her head, yes. Uh, the random kernel issue was one that we ran into. Um, it was uh, AR64 images were not composing. And so we're like, why is that? And so I launched one off, a test one. And sure enough, it just like sat there, didn't do anything, and then timed out. And so then I looked on the console, and it got to just you know part way through the boot, and then just sort of sat there. And then Patrick looked at it even further, and he found that it was, yeah, the way that the kernel is using, well, it was a, a confluence of things. GNU TLS, I think it was, using um, libgcrypt. That's right. That's right. So yeah, it's a, a confluence of a bunch of things. Uh, libgcrypt using FIPS, so it needed randomness, and the kernel changing the way randomness is gathered initially on boot. Um, I don't know how if that actually ever got solved upstream, but. Okay, yeah, the the issue has been solved in in libgcrypt, but again, it was a. a a strange one to try and uh, debug because it didn't seem like anything was going wrong. It was just timing out. <laughs> Another fun one that we hit very recently, uh, DNF 3.1 uh, landed in Rawhide. And live media uh, images stopped composing because they said package whatever is blocked and for a whole bunch of packages. And this <laughs> this gets back to the fact that a lot of this stuff that we do has no spec, right? I mean, if you ask somebody, what is a well-formatted comps file? What is the, uh, you know, what is the spec for this? Well, there isn't really one. And what is a well-formatted kickstart file? Well, we don't know the behavior of some of this stuff. So what had happened here is that we have a base live CD uh, package, package uh, kickstart file that includes the standard group. And at some point, the workstation folks, to reduce size, decided they did not want to include the standard group. So they did minus at standard. Well, old DNF and yum treated this as you wanted standard. Now you don't want standard. That cancels out. 
DNF 3.1 made the assumption that you said you wanted standard. You said you don't want any of the packages in standard. We're going to block those and not let you install any of those packages that are in that group. And unfortunately, that has dbus and core utils and things like that. So it did not work. Uh, the DNF folks fixed this up pretty quickly. But this is a case where it's the problem isn't necessarily that they you know, change the behavior. It's that we don't define some of our inputs very well at all. Um, so the uh, we did get a rawhide compose today. I thought I'd share the last uh, four or five things that have been preventing it from working the last few weeks. Uh, first, we ran into a Grub2 relocation toolchain tool chain issue on ARM, where uh, it was doing something funny to the Grub2 uh, binary and messing it up, essentially. And Peter fixed that pretty quickly. Uh, only to run into file conflicts between two of the Grub2 sub-packages. So he fixed that. And then uh, the next Compose after that was one of these uh, uncoordinated changes issues. Uh, man pages got, or man pages used to carry a man page for the time command. But now the time package wanted to carry that man page. So they both had it. And it was a conflict and nothing installed. <laughs> So again, that got fixed quickly. But you have to realize that between all of these issues, you fix the one issue, and then you start a compose, and it's eight and a half, nine, eight, ten 10 hours later before you can tell that the next thing that is broken. Um, so that makes things take a really long time. Uh, the latest thing, which was just fixed yesterday by, yesterday by Adam Williamson, uh, DNF 3.1 changed. Uh, again, uh, defining things in the dnf.conf or yum.conf, the repo files, we have a failover priority equals uh, uh, parameter. And Koji was passing this many for many years, I'm sure, passing this uh, configuration in there with no value. So it was failover priority equals nothing. And DNF was let, DNF previously just ignored it. DNF 3.1 said uh, traceback. <laughs> OK, so uh, I thought I'd throw out a whole bunch of problems here. And uh, if people have ideas for these, we can certainly uh, discuss them and write, try and write them down and see what we can do. Um, so one of the problems here is that as I mentioned, it's the ability to find breaking changes and block them. Uh, so there's a proposal for gating that has been discussed many times on the devel list. And I actually have a slide on that here in a second uh, we'll talk about. Um, ability to test proposed fixes all the time as they come in, because this would help us be able to isolate things like that DNF, uh, the Grub2 relocation issue. Uh, stuff like that and catch it before we have to endure eight or ten hours of composing. Um, the compose time is obviously a problem uh, for iterating over this stuff. Uh, the signing issues, which I uh, mentioned earlier, we can uh, probably address by monitoring and, and doing a few things. And uh, I also wanted to add here marketing issues because I still hear people saying, you know, Rawhide's unusable day to day, or uh, it's bleeding edge, or ha ha, you know, it eats babies, or whatnot. Uh, I've been running Rawhide on my laptop for like six years, something like that. And sure, there are problems, but uh, I think it's vastly better than it used to be uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, broken dependencies don't cause the headache that they used to because DNF basically will say, I'll resolve this. Oh, all this stuff is broken. I'll just not update that. So you stick to the working thing until that gets unlog jammed in Rawhide. Um, I think that we're also getting better about uh, catching these things in composes instead of letting them get out to end user systems. All of those DNF or grub things would have been caught by end users in the MASH era and have to be fixed by them, by people, and iterated and pushed out again and breaking users stuff. Um, let's see. So just real quickly, the gating proposal, you can look up the full thing on the uh, devel list. 
Um, basically, we want to teach Bodhi about Rawhide and try and make it as transparent as we possibly can. Uh, so basically, all changes, if you do an update, just a regular one package update for no reason, or for a, a version update or whatever, it would get a Bodhi update. You wouldn't have to worry about this. Uh, in the common case, it would get the update and tests would run on it. It'd get a plus one and it'd go out in the next day, just like it does today. Um, if you have a collection of packages that you need to build, we would teach Bodhi about side tags. So that would add a little bit more overhead, but it would add a lot more uh, uh, help to our composes. So Bodhi then would get a side tag ability. So you'd say, I need a side tag. Bodhi would say, here's your side tag. You'd build your 20 packages or whatever. It would take them as a collection and test them as a collection. And so if there was a failure on those 20 packages, uh, you could address that, iterate over it, and then get them through. And so this would help us, you know, if there's a problem with a, a group of packages or whatever, we can see what that case is. We could test that whole collection at the same time, um, which would be extremely helpful for QA. Because right now, things come in at a, a pace that the maintainer is doing, and it isn't necessarily you know, reflecting on the completed state that they want all their packages to be in. Hmm? Uh, actually, so the question was, how does this affect the build route? And I believe we said that side tags would uh, have their own or populate their own. So you can build against other things in that side tag, but not in the base. No. Uh, so the question was, uh, if if a compiler is rebuilt and you want to use that compiler, um, you know, that same day. So after it does the gating, and it will be it would be tagged into like just F29. So it would add to the build route after after the test for it went out as rawhide the next day. If that makes sense. Right. Exactly. It take however long the CI stuff takes to run and approve it. All right, so let's see. Uh, updates merge into pending tag uh, for testing, and then the tests run on that. This would also give us a, another place for feedback uh, for users, if, uh, if need be. Uh, another thing that we really love to have, and I, I believe Mohan has been working on this, uh, is a quick smoke testing compose type of thing. This would really help us for uh, critical packages uh, kernel, anaconda, grub, lorax, stuff that's used in all the images. Because right now, we untag something, and we have to wait 12, you know, 8, 10 hours to see if everything works. It would be really nice to upfront see that there's an update to one of these things and go, OK, let's do a test compose. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Untag it and you know, get back to a working state until that can be fixed. Uh, also, a subset of images for OpenQA would be very useful. Uh, if we do just the, the real high profile ones to start with, workstation, live media, uh, server DVD, that kind of stuff, OpenQA can run tests on those and, and tell us uh, you know, if a proposed thing is going to work or not. So um, more future stuff. Uh, I put Oh, man, my smiley didn't show up up there. Bummer. Uh, I put drop i686 with a smiley. Uh, we now still continue to make all i686 images that we've always made. So that's like every lab, every spin, workstation, server, you know, that is a lot of images. And it may be something to consider to say, you know, we're going to cut our compose time by a couple of hours by just not making all that stuff or making less of it. <laughs> Justin? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, Justin points out that we can talk to the uh, I-686 SIG and see if they're targeting or care about any subset of those specifically. And that's a, that's a real good idea because, you know, th there's just so many of these and I'm unsure how many people are using them, uh, especially when you look at things like, you know, the design lab spin, uh, you know, how many people are doing intensive GIMP work on a, a I-686 box. <laughs> Right, right. So they're more interested in XFC or LXD or, you know, those sort of things. Yep. Yep, that's a good idea. Um, try and do more in parallel. Uh, this was already discussed quite a bit at the uh, the Make Composes Faster talk the other day, so I encourage you to go look at that uh, recording when you get a chance. Um, and actually, we talked about the incremental mode also there. Uh, being able to cache a previous compose and use uh, things that have not changed from that compose if we're wish wishing to uh, do, do things faster. So there's always uh, new deliverables, modules, uh, new OS tree, new containers, all kinds of things. Uh, but Rawhide should really strive to push the latest working versions to users. Uh, there's a, a few cases where we're not right now, like the Rawhide container is, is really old at this point, and hopefully we're fixing that. Um, I don't think, I think OS Tree is all on two-week uh, cadence, but at one point we had an OS Tree that was um, uh, running off of the Koji build root, I, th I believe, and we may want to explore doing something like that at, at a later date. OS tree lends itself very well to testing Rawhide because you can uh, bisect your problem. You know, this is working at this point. It's not working here. All right, I'm going to just bisect and see where it broke and what, uh, what changed. So a few things for the future. Uh, new mock. Right now we're using an older version of mock in all our builders and we need to move up to the newest version. Uh, we need to leverage systemd and spawn. Uh, bootstrap mode is something we need for uh, Apple builds. Um, so we need to really start working on that, especially since there's a lot of pressure now with Python 2 going away next year. So we really need to move move on and get Python 2 out of, out of the environment. Um, we may want to consider uh, allowing packages to go backwards in some cases. This was discussed on the Devel list uh, recently. Um, in the past, uh, distro sync, the DNF distro sync, didn't work that great, but I've been using it lately for, for all my updates, and uh, it's doing a pretty good job. But as somebody pointed out on the mailing list, you kind of want a, a common understanding here a common platform for everyone to build on. If you're trying to integrate your packages and then somebody who you depend on is moves their package back versions, it makes it very difficult for you to be able to find that thing usable. So um, I don't know. We may want to look at that rule. Right now, Fesco, there's a Fesco rule that you're not allowed to go backward in an update that's shipped out in Rawhide. But we may want to revisit that. Uh, we may bring in a lot more users with Rawhide containers because it's a lot easier way to consume Rawhide. You just fire up a container and you have the environment, you have those newer packages, uh, you can do tests, you can do anything you can do, do in a container. Um, so I think we may get a lot of people uh, looking at using it uh, for that uh, reason. Uh, mass bug fixes and spec changes, this has been something that's kind of upticked uh, in the, the last year or so, and uh, I think it's probably a very good thing to do because it saves people a lot of time and it ends up making things better. Uh, but we need to... Uh, we need to look into uh, to the, to that and making that easier, leveraging that. Uh, Python 3 I mentioned, we want to uh, move everything to Python 3. A lot of things are. But uh, we need the newer mock, and we need uh, Koji, I think, still has a dependency somewhere. Uh, I forget where. 
Uh, also, there's the release ver equals rawhide change, which was discussed on the devel list. Basically, this is to allow uh, the uh, Fedora release in rawhide to advertise its version as rawhide instead of the number. Right now, it says 29. Uh, if we do this, it ends up making things like QA and so forth a lot easier because they don't have to compute what number is rawhide right now. And th if they want a rawhide something, they can just say release for rawhide. Uh, we can make the number still work also, but I think this will actually be, be a nice win for making it uniform. We can also drop the uh, uh, Fedora repos rawhide package because all of Fedora, Fedora updates, Fedora updates testing can all use the rawhide name with Mirror Manager and it will just all work. So that will also save things needing to be changed and tweaked. I uh, mentioned OS Tree uh, earlier for testing. I think that there's uh, a lot of ability to leverage OS Tree for, for rawhide testing. Uh, it, if we can get the compose time of those down enough, it might be worth having something where we compose an, an OS Tree for every package that lands in the build root. Then you could bisect actually down to the package level what broke some particular use case of yours. Actually close to the end. How are we doing on time? Hum? Oh, all right. Well, questions, comments, uh, concerns? Yeah. Right, so the question is uh, about uh, if if we have these periods where there's uh, like a week of no rawhides, we're not updating the package repositories on the mirrors and people can't use those packages for other builds and other things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think, something that we can address with the, uh, the gating and the CI things. Basically make it so that these composes are not this unreliable. Um, that's, I, I think that's, the easiest solution. The thing we could do is go back to the the mash world where we push the trees out, even if the images don't compose. But the problem there is that we're just kind of pushing it, pushing the problem off a little bit. It isn't actually solving it. So, yeah. Uh, so the question is, what what uh, happens with uh, signing Rawhide on the branching day? Um, we uh, talked about that a lot last branching. I don't know if we came up with very many solutions. I think we were going to, well, in the past, we have signed it with both keys and, you know, done that. Um, yeah, I don't know if we came up with a good solution there because it there's a period of time where they may be both signed, but you also have to push out the new, uh, the new signature or the RPM signature file. Um, we could talk about that some more and see if we can come up with a better, better solution. But signing them in advance is definitely good. Go on. <laughs> yes, right, yes, we should sign all those now, yeah. <laughs> Huh, yeah, I'm not sure. I seem to remember a ticket about that. Uh, the question was uh, the RPM OS tree silver blue composes in Rawhide aren't functioning currently. I saw a ticket on that. I don't remember what the, the problem was. Um, we also actually just tried out uh, essentially silver blue not too long ago, and 
there was a problem. RPMS tree couldn't layer packages, and there were some other issues. But I think those got solved. So I don't. We'd have to look and see what the the problem is. Uh, that brings up another issue: is that when these required deliverables fail, you know, the only peer, the only people who pay attention to them are the people who care about them. You know, Relinj does not have the cycles to care about any of those. So uh, if something breaks and nobody is actively looking at it, it can be broken for a while. Right. Right. So so that brings up the broken dependencies report. Uh, there isn't one currently because the old one was written in yum, written to use yum and did not understand rich dependencies. <laughs> Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Right. So, see, so the observation was that if we uh, pointed out the things that fail in the rawhide message, people would be more likely to notice them and fix them. That's a good point. That's that's a very good point. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. It's. <laughs> Uh, the question was, uh, what is the user base? And we don't have a real good idea. It's small. But uh, that's one of the things the changing the release version to Rawhide from the number would give us, because then we could actually look at the people who are using Rawhide specifically, because the number gets really murky, or especially around branching time, whether somebody is on 29, or is that rawhide before branching, or was it rawhide after, or a branch after branching, that kind of thing? So doing rawhide there will actually give us better numbers for that, but it's it's not large right now. I I think Matthew Miller may have some information on that, how many it was, but I'd say thousands at most. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the the observation was there may be more more users because there's more interested in things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I uh, I filed bugs on uh, RPMOS tree and uh, Podman because it wasn't working, and uh, on RPMOS tree, uh, you know, people were like, "Oh, it works fine on F28." Well, I'm not on F28, so. <laughs> Yeah, so we actually, there used to be long ago a, uh, a blog site called uh, israwhidebroken.com. <laughs> and we used that for a little while, but it's really hard because things move so fast. So, like, you know, somebody will notice a problem, and then you post about it, and then it's fixed already or, or something like that. Um, we talked actually last year, I think, about setting up something in Bugzilla, a um, whiteboard field or something like that, where you could say, you know, uh, rawhide important or rawhide noticeable, something like that. And then you could do a Bugzilla search and see if there were any new bugs. I think that might be useful. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, so the question is uh, where to look for bro broken issues and packages in Rawhide. And yeah, IRC is probably, sometimes if it's really bad, it will make the mailing list, but not always. <laughs> All right, anything else? Anyone? All right. Oh, sure. Uh, we need to talk to Randy about that. I don't think he's in here. He has a whole bunch of other stuff on his plate, so I don't know. I'm thinking it's probably more a uh, F30 type of thing, but I don't know when he has it planned. Uh, but we really need that stuff to land before we can do it in a meaningful way. So, okay, okay.
Thank you, everybody.